Good evening and welcome to our webinar, A Child's Grief in Today's World. I'm Pat Loader, the Executive Director of the Compassionate Friends. This evening, all attendees are in listen-only mode. To ask a question, you will need to type it into your question area on your screen's control panel. To get to the control panel, click on the arrow on the top right side of your screen. Our presenter this evening is Hazel Woodward a nationally certified licensed professional counselor and a certified thanatologist. She has spent over 15 years studying the effects of trauma and grief, specializing in complicated trauma and grief. Hazel has also explored methods of treating grief, particularly in children. She has been a part of the Compassionate Friends since the death of her own daughter in 1987. This tragic event left her with two children to help navigate through their own individual grief response. Welcome, Hazel. Hi, Pat, and thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. This is a, um, a rather complicated topic. Uh, we actually could do a weekend seminar on this, but this is a one-hour webinar, and we are allowing 15 minutes for questions. So no doubt I will have left out some important information. And it was really difficult to narrow it down to the key issues. So uh, keeping that in mind, uh, let me make this thing uh, go. OK, next. <laughs> so I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, Just click your mouse. There you go. I did it. Uh -huh, I did there it. There you go. I clicked the mouse. OK. OK. Children, uh, the first this slide talks about that we need to be, I think we're all aware that children are aware of loss and grief. Almost every Disney character uh, features death or loss of a parent in a lot of the early movies and even the more current ones. For, um, you know, Finding Nemo, everybody uh, knows about poor Bambi. Uh, we don't know what happened to Little Mermaid's mom. Maybe she divorced her dad. Uh, and even in movies, and I can tell your age if you remember Old Yeller. I'm still recovering from that. And it's even evident in young adult literature. For example, the Harry Potter series. He's an orphan. He, he's, his parents are murdered. There's a bad guy after him. Lots of danger. The Lemony Snicket steer, series. That's three orphans, and they have a mean guardian, and he's not nice to them at all. And then, of course, most recently, uh, the Hunger Games, which really is maybe more for an older child, but I'm finding more and more elementary school students who do read it. I've given you some excerpts um, of uh, books illustrating grief. Uh, the first one is from Saving June, and which is about a young girl whose sister completes suicide two weeks prior to her high school graduation. And this young girl is the one who finds her sister's body. And at the same time, their parents are divorcing. Mom's grieving herself into a real breakdown, and Dad is sort of blissfully ignoring them because he's, he's got a new life. Next would be uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince quote, which I think is quite beautifully and worded beautifully because he has, uh, he's been so sad, and he hears this music of the phoenix singing, and he says it's his own grief turned magically to song. The next uh, um, excerpt is from uh, Alice Hoffman's Green Angel. Now, Green Angel is somewhat of apocalyptic, and it's about a young girl who experiences her own 9-11 event. She looks across the river where her entire family is shopping and the city has blown up and engulfed in flames. And she's, she's alone. And when they left, she had been very sullen and stayed behind because she didn't want to go. And again, uh, a quote from um, Suzanne Collins in the Hunger Games trilogy, Mockingjay, book two. It, uh, that is about the, keeping the concept of that whole Hunger Games as children killing children. And then this is a game. It's devised by uh, authorities. It's part entertainment. It's part brutal intimidation. It's televised and broadcast so that everyone in this book um, in this country has to watch it. And if you think about it, it really resonates um, with the reality shows we have today, like Survivor or American Gladiator. 
There are some examples, uh, really excellent examples of empathic grief or empathetic grief in literature, again, from uh, The Hunger Games, the uh, book's middle book, Catching Fire, uh, when uh, Katniss, the protagonist, meets the family of one of the children who was about 12 who was killed uh, during The Hunger Games. And she, she's so empathetic, she sees their family and it just breaks her heart. Uh, and the next uh, quote, The Madness Space, is a book of poems by Andrea Gibson. And it's about a boy who jumps off a bridge, convinced he's entirely alone and no one cares. And it addresses everything from hate crimes to playgrounds, from international conflict to hometown conflict. And the thing I, that I did leave off was the final verse was, my bones said, write those poems. Now I'm going to jump into normal reactions in children. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm going to assume that um, people, almost everyone that's watching has an idea. That they start off with the physical reactions. Uh, you're going to hear, I don't feel good. I'm sick to my stomach. And um, last night I had a dream and, and they were going to hurt me. Um, some grief reactions with children are going to occur immediately, and some may occur later on. But in general, uh, children's grief tends to manifest in physical and behavioral expression rather than verbal. And the main factors that influence how a child grieves are the relationship with the person that died, the nature of the death, when, how, and where the person died, the child's own personality and previous experiences with death, um, their religious and cultural beliefs, input from the media, and above all, what they're taught about death and grief from the adults, and the availability of family, social, and community support. So, you know, chiefly you see on there that they you know, they have a headache, the stomach ache, problems breathing, um, uh, changes in eating habits, and all that means that they, you know, they're hungry and, well, they're not hungry, and it's just kind of hard to, to gauge. Down on cognitive symptoms, it's what you see there is what we're seeing is an inability to concentrate. For example, they might say, well, I just couldn't focus today. I don't remember anything that I learned today. Um, and being obsessed or uh, with or preoccupied. My, my dad was the best dad in the world, or, or my mom was the prettiest lady ever. Uh, and they repetitively looking at photos of, of the deceased, and uh, you know, and that um, it is a way of their coping with this loss. So they can under start thinking about the why, but keep looking. Do they really exist? This is now. This is now. And each time that is a, it's pro they're processing this whole time, making it, wrapping their little minds around that. Okay. Uh, I have visual hallucination of the disease, deceased, and sometimes it, that's really common. It's very real to the kid, um, and sometimes it's very competent, but sometimes it'll scare them to death. So they do this uh, by incorporating, and you know, and they they're taking on um, d the mannerisms um, such as disciplining their other kids, you know, their siblings, or they they may take on that role that they before they've never done. And then, of course, um, the behavioral changes. So I really hate it, but um, this, this is awful. Um, it's, the denial of death is not unusual, but it is very difficult for adults to endure watching a child do that. They may start out with, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. That didn't happen. You're wrong. And even later on, I can't, I can't believe my grandmother's dead. I mean, I can't, I can't believe it. It's a year in it, and I just can't believe it. And usually when the realization of the death is too overwhelming, the child will temporarily deny that it even happened. It's not unusual at all. It's a protective mechanism. It's a way for them to comprehend really painful information at a speed in which they're ready. It's most common in the first few months, but it may reappear at different times. Of course, um, they're gonna. I miss the sadness, the despair. I miss my mom. I want her back, or I don't want to live without my best friend. There are many ways that children are going to exhibit uh, these feelings of sadness um, and you know and despair. Uh, 
the full realization of their loss doesn't happen all at once, but it does. Sadness, loneliness, and depression um, can follow. Um, again, the depression, you, you know they'll be isolated, maybe too quiet, uh, too withdrawn. Uh, anger and, and acting out, that's, that's a real um, joy to be around. I hate you, and I hate you too, and I hate my family, and my schools, and I hate my life, and I hate everything. I keep thinking of my nephew Daniel, who I won't repeat that little story. And uh, he, it's, it's just easier to feel mad than to feel sad. And children typically strike out with anger at the people with whom they feel closest and the most safe. Uh, and there's really re many reasons to feel angry. They're angry at the person who died for leaving. They're, they're angry at God, at other family members. They're mad at the doctor. And they may even be mad at themselves and engage in a little magical thinking, uh, <laughs> thinking that they um, caused the death. They had something to do with it. And this anger often originates from feelings of being helpless and having no control. And then this is where the fun comes in, is that the children sometimes channel their anger by defying authority, rebelling, everything, displaying antisocial tendencies. Antisocial behavior in a bereaved child is often an attempt to keep themselves away from any close relationship and the possibility of being abandoned again. So it's important to note that anger expression generally is more socially acceptable among boys than girls. Younger children are more physically expressive and direct when they're mad. They're going to have a hit, hissy fit, temper tantrum, throw things. Um, but they're, and they're often, anger outbursts are often set off by um, uh, routine things. You have seemingly important triggers. Uh, we also will see some regressive behavior. That means they're going back to a time, a uh, younger type behavior, where it was safe and where everything was normal. Um, excuse me. There's the, as far as fear and anxiety and panic, they, they're going to. These children sometimes wonder, "Are you going to die? Is it, uh, you know, when you go to sleep tonight, are you going to die? Um, and who's going to take me? Who, who, who's going to take care of me? Who's going to take me to school?" And I think I'll get cancer too, since other people did. So they react with fear and panic when they lose someone, and they may be afraid of the intensity of their own feelings, and they worry about everybody, and especially about becoming sick or dying themselves. And um, they become afraid of the dark, sleeping alone, and, or just being separated or uh, abandoned by another significant adult. And unfortunately, this is especially true if a parent's died and the other parent is having their own grief reaction and is somewhat detached from the child because they, they just don't have that energy to do that. Um, again, another thing that's very important is that um, the feeling that they are very responsible, that self-blame, it's all my fault, I did it. You know, I, I, I made Janie die because she broke my doll and I told her I wish she was dead and, and she's dead. So, um, uh, you know, or I never liked my brother. He always teased me, and now he's dead. He died. I, I feel so. I feel so guilty. And so that's how they start feeling responsible for it. Again, they're very focused on themselves, uh, and so they think, well, I, I can gain some control if I take some responsibility. It was my fault. When in reality, they had nothing to do with it. Um, the jealousy part comes in when they're jealous. When other children start complaining about their own parents or their own siblings or their own friends or anything. Um, like, well, at least you have them, or at least you have some parents. And children uh, hate it sometimes. This is what I hear. I hate it when all the kids at school talk badly about their parents or their friends or whatever. They ought to feel lucky they hate them have parents. I'm by myself. And the final one is acceptance. Now, I don't know why I bother to put that, because it always just irritates me to no end. I would much rather use reconciliation or reconstructing their life. Acceptance to me sounds like it's okay. Well, it is not okay and it will never be okay. However, I can deal with reconciliation. Coming to accept the fact that this happened and recon reconstructing their life that includes this event. Moving on. And kids do that. It, and they also will re-grieve. Um, 
So moving right along to the next one, there's some fa I call this the faces of grief in children because you know how are they looking? You're looking at your child, and I'm going to make this fairly quick. Um, you know, children can be sad when they first hear of it, but later on, as I said, they're fine. Uh, sometimes they act out. It's just a nonverbal way of communicating distress. They might not even know the words um, to express how they feel. Um, sometimes I think they have to take the place and help mom or dad be the big man or the big woman syndrome. Again, I've mentioned the eating behaviors. I've mentioned explosive emotions. I've mentioned fear, guilt, self-blame. This behavior um, means, you know, sometimes they think they hear their loved one's voice or they think they saw them in a crowd. On, on occasion, they may say, God, I really feel, I really sense the presence of, of, of my friend. I felt like she was right there with me. And these experiences all fall within the range of normal if it happens. So don't get too, too upset. Uh, again, there's that lack of concentration and ability to focus. Um, everything else I've already mentioned, the lost loneliness, asphyxiated behaviors, the physiological symptoms, sore throat, stomach. Their bodies are expressing what they can't express in words. And children with these symptoms may need to be held and comforted. And surprise, surprise, here is a relief. Now, why would they feel relief? Well, if someone dies after a very long illness um, and life is revolved around the illness, when it's over, there may be a feeling of relief. Um, where are we? OK, thank you. Uh, and so also, what if the person that, who has uh, died or the people, the bully, uh, it may be a, a, actually secretly a relief. Thank God they're here. They're not going to bother me anymore. I'll go back to my normal life. I don't have to go back to that mean person's house or that guy's never going to bother me again. Bullying is a big, big, big issue. That's another webinar. And again, the reconciliation that I mentioned, it's just, um, it's different for every person, every adult and every child. And they'll just start beginning to accept that their lives are never going to be the same as before. There's a new normal for them. And they've learned to live with their loss. And again, the vivid dreams, they may experience very vivid dreams in which their loved one is present or their friends are present. Again, this, this can be anybody. It may be with divorce. It doesn't necessarily have to be death. It may be moving. So, but when it's a dream, once the person awakens, they may have trouble coming back to reality. Now I'm going to jump into some complicated grief reactions. Um, oftentimes, you know, you'll hear, I want, there are examples of some behaviors, are, I want to kill myself, or they start giving away uh, valuable possessions, or they get too preoccupied with suicidal themes in the media, and a strong desire to be with um, their friends who have died, and they may even have sort of self-punishment ideation. I don't deserve to live. I suppose that would be survivor guilt. They may have insomnia and nightmares. Um, you may see persistent personality changes, and that would be when an optimist child becomes a pessimist, or when a pleasant child becomes a bully, or a, a secure child becomes anxious and afraid. They can become aggressive. Uh, they start doing dangerous risk-taking behaviors or behaviors that are really dangerous to others. Uh, down here we have a saying, hey, y'all, watch this. Now, um, another thing would be, again, I've already talk, spoken of, the excessive and inappropriate guilt. Uh, they just can't get over the, the, the they, they caused it. They had a role in that death. They also lose their energy, get very, very tired uh, on a prolonged daily Basis. Notice it says extreme. They can't socialize with others. They, they, they just are depressed. They, they can't do it. They can't get out of bed. They don't want to get out of bed. They don't feel like playing. They're going to lie around on the couch. And a few more of the um, complicated grief reactions uh, are pervasive fantasies that interfere with normal functioning. In other words, believing that one, they're going to come back, uh, especially if, if I'm good, they'll come back. And phobias, being afraid of dying. That might happen to me. What if that happens to me? And hypervigilance, by checking on everybody, checking on themselves, looking if it was an illness, looking for symptoms, and being hyper alert when they, you know, they get into a car or they're sitting into a, in a car if someone died in a car accident. Um, 
and when they, again, I'm mentioning, I'm getting redundant now, but sometimes they will assume the chores and responsibilities that are not developmentally appropriate. In other words, mom dies, little girl becomes the cook. Dad dies, little boy thinks he's got to do the yard. That's my cell phone. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to kill it, but my grandchildren hit it. Um, and then, of course, unfortunately, um, we have the drug and the alcohol use. And don't kid yourself. Children as early as second grade um, are using, doing drugs and um, sneaking in and getting the alcohol. So uh, that's really hard to believe, but the bottom line is that's what they do. In today's world, kids are uh, ex exposed to much more types of social media, iPads, cable TV, uh, Kindle Fires, iTouches, iPhones, home computers, and much of that information is not presented in a child-friendly format. And parents aren't necessarily prepared or willing to even discuss what the kids have seen or heard. And this world can seem scary to these kids. Children have been kidnapped on buses in Alabama. A kindergartner was kidnapped off a bus and held for six days as a hostage. Prior to that, his bus driver was killed in front of these children. Children are murdered in school, the Sandy Hook event, Columbine. Um, children are often killed by their parents, Casey Anthony, Andrea Yates, Susan Smith. And then there's the ones that we don't necessarily hear about unless, of course, you live in Kansas City and whereupon a bullet sliced through the body of a four-year-old while he was sitting in a car with his daddy. Turns out he was just an innocent and unsuspecting victim of a gang shooting. He's just sitting in the car with his dad. In another case in um, Georgia, a 14-year-old boy was found bound and shot dead in the family's home. And he had evidently come home and interrupted a robbery. And one more thing. Um, that um, you know, there were, in December there was a seven-year-old who was sitting in the car, and he died in this gun in a gun store parking lot. His dad's gun went off inside the car and struck him in the chest. He was strapped in his booster seat. So you see, you know, there's many you know things that that don't get necessarily get the media attention unless you live in that area. Um, I want to. I, I can't help but, but just share this with you because I think it says everything about um, about children having to go to school, which used to be safe. Um, uh, in the um, Sandy Hook, one of the children, Lauren Rousseau, she was six. She's a sole survivor. Uh, excuse me, Lauren uh, Rousseau was a teacher. Um, they didn't identify the child. I beg your pardon, but only one little girl survived that classroom. And she survived it by playing dead because she had blood all over her. And she stayed still until it got quiet. And she, when she thought it was safe to leave, she, she ran. And she was the first child to escape the building. And you know what she said when she reached her mom? She said, Mommy, I'm okay, but all my friends are dead. How do you, how do you deal with that? That's something she's never, never going to forget. And I could go more on that, but I won't. I don't have time. So on our next slide, grief in today's world. Again, my generation worried about wars fought on foreign lands, Vietnam, um, uh, Japan. In the 1980s, my children worried about nuclear strikes. Today's generation worries about terrorist attacks in the United States. It just happened. 9/11. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it. It happened here. But additionally. Now they're having a mom or a dad in the armed forces who is deployed. Just go on the internet and look at the surprise welcome home and you see the tears. You see the terror, the relief that their mom or daddy got home safe. Um, today's generation worries about riding bikes alone um, or doing normal activities. Let's go to the movie tonight. What about Aurora, Colorado? People went to the movies. What happened? They got shot. The youngest person to die was a child. I think she was around 10. So uh, how many are you seeing? So, uh, have you seen this child? They disappeared. So these kids see this too, and they talk about it in school. Now, how do you respond to the media? Well, one thing you can do is limit the exposure to the news, whether it's TV, radio, satellite, internet, whatever. Do your best. Add restrictions to the internet access on devices. And you can find that usually in the settings area. 
be prepared to discuss the events with your child if it's indicated. And this is dictated by your personal belief system and your parenting style. Okay, I can't tell you how to do it because it's going to be dictated by how, who you are and how you handle things and how you look at things. Um, look for teachable moments when your child's open for learning. In other words, you know, you might, they might need, they're probably going to need a lot of reassurance. Most people live to be very, very, very old. And, and, you know, honey, it's not typical for, or usual for children to be hurt by others. You know, it, this, this isn't normal. And, you know, they're, you know, be prepared for some questions that you maybe never, ever thought you'd have to answer. Let's move on to religion. That's always a scary thing. Um, but it's an important source of strength for many families and many children. But remember, children are very literal. So saying, it's God's will may send a mixed message that's frightening or confusing. I mean, what do you mean it was, was, was God's will that my friends died or, or my, my baby sister didn't wake up from her nap? Or saying something like, uh, Bonnie's happy in heaven. That might not be necessarily comforting. She might want Bonnie here. And it's important to inquire, how does the child perceive what is explained about the death? Ask, what do you think? What do you think? and allow the child to express their religious and spiritual concerns. If they say, I don't, believe, I don't think I believe in God, I don't think I like God, that's not the time to start jumping to a lecture. That's just, I understand that, I understand you feel that way. They're just expressing the view, doesn't mean it's going to stay forever. The next slide is addressing guidelines for handling really specific expressions of grief. For example, sadness and depression and everything else that you can read. Um, one of the things you can do is, for sadness and depression, have them draw memories of, of the deceased and show to others. Show photographs and describe the keepsakes to others. Help them make a memory scrapbook. Engage in physical activities. Go play you know, basketball. Getting them out. Physical activity. With anger, you can allow the child to dissipate anger with various activities. As I said, basketball, they might want to get a tennis racket and, and just whack the pillows on the beds. Ask the kids about their anger. You seem pretty angry. You know, again, this isn't the time for lectures. It's just handling specific expressions of grief. They're acting angry. You seem really angry. Do you want to talk about it? Um, and ask the child to suggest ways of responding to anger. What do you think would make you feel good? What do you think you could, you could do to help yourself? But maintain um, household rules and chores. Don't change it just because we're a grieving family. They need the, the, con the continuity and the consistency. Uh, with guilt and regret, Oftentimes we find that writing a letter or drawing a picture describing any unfinished business, I'm sorry that I called you a big poo-poo dead, um, they may want to write a note about feelings about guilt and tie, tie it to a helium balloon in order to let it go. Very, very symbolic. I'm, I'm sorry you're dead. I don't know what happened, but I sure miss you and I just think I was the one that was supposed to go and you went and let them, it's symbolic to release that helium balloon. You can also create puppets and so that the child puppet can talk to the puppet of the deceased and they actually have a dialogue and that's sort of a cycle drama in and of itself. With fear, you want to help the child identify the fear. Okay, what, what, what are you most afraid of? What, what scares you the most? And provide repetitive, repetitive reassurances that all's going to be okay. Spend time alone with the child and reassure them that they're very, very special and very, 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 very much loved. Um, and you may have to um, explain the vocabulary of grief and of death. You may have to explain, mommy, what's cremation? What does rounds mean? What, is that, what kind of gun is that? Is that what they, you might have to explain cemetery, burial. There are all kinds, of, we never know what's going to come out of the kid's mouth. And so be prepared to explain the vocabulary of grief and death. And again, with the physical complaints, I think we've already, you know, covered that enough. Um, ask them about other possible feelings or symptoms or emotions. And remind them why the death occurred. And you know what? If you need to, take him to the pediatrician, but let him know ahead of time so he can reassure the child that the child is healthy 
child is fine. Uh, now, we've been talking about children's grieving. Now we're going to talk about talking to the children about the loss. And trust me on this, um, it can, it, you know, you have to assess your own anxiety before talking to your child. All I can tell you, be direct, be honest, and age appropriate when sharing information. Just answer the question. Keep in mind that if you're anxious, it's likely they're going to be anxious. We're their role models. Being direct and honest and age appropriate is what are they asking? And it's okay to let the kids know you're upset. It's okay to say, I don't know. But keep in mind, just answer what they're asked. Don't add on to it. Allow the children's question, uh, excuse me, allow the children's questions to guide the dialogue, okay? They might want to change the subject in the middle of it, uh, and then the dialogue is over. You know, it's, you're not in control of that. Let them determine it. And of course, reassuring the children to the greatest extent possible that it is still a safe world. Um, that it is that Sandy Hook and these other places that have they have that now they do they do have lockdown procedures. They do have um, as many ways as they can possibly think of to keep our children safe. That the world is still overall a safe world to live in. Um, but again, just on this, it would be um, being able to really assess your own anxiety. Assess your own anxiety. And so coping strategies for you, if you're a parent or if you're a teacher or a counselor or just the next door neighbor, they decide to come ask you quest that question. Um, allow the child to cry. We all tend to um, want to make them stop. You know, when you hand, and the same thing, we do the same thing um, with adults. When, if you, I, I was part of the Oklahoma City bomb uh, treatment trauma team, and one of the things I noticed is whenever somebody started to cry, people would practically throw Kleenex boxes at them. And the message is, I'm sure you want a Kleenex to wipe your eyes or blow your nose, but the subliminal message is stop it. You know, don't cry. You don't. You don't have to cry. Um, you want to allow them. It's okay. Patting them on the shoulder and remaining silent is just fine. Saying, "Poor baby, I, I know you hurt." Acknowledging it. But whatever you do, you don't say, "Look, it's been nine months." Cut the crying. Okay. Allow them to cry. Answer their questions. Again, I've covered that in a little way. You don't know what the answer. I don't even. I can't tell you what questions you're going to get. It may be. Well, why did they? Why? Why did that man come do that? Well, well, why are people mean in the world? Why does God let things like that happen? Or what's happening to Daddy's body in the ground? I, you know, there are. It can go anyway. You know, anyway. And some you might be sort of surprised, and you may want to, again look for opportunities to teach your child so that, I mean, we normalize death. This is not an unfounded rumor. We're all going to die. We just don't focus on it. Okay? So, can, you know, another thing is considering creative ways to commemorate a loss. Again, writing letters. Ch little girls, I know, love to write, write points. Love it. Um, I see lots of little boys drawing um, airplanes um, indicative of the war or the news that they've seen, even a little clip of it. Um, create a scrapbook, you know, finding mementos, um, you know, that belong to um, the child. Um, you know, so that they can make a, a, a treasure box that also helps you feel like you're doing something. That you're, you're, you may start doing it for yourself and the child becomes interested in what you're doing and you can include them uh, in doing that. And the first anniversary is often difficult for children as they may relive very intensely the last days or days of the grief. Um, the grief event. Um, they need to know um, that it's okay to talk about it. Children tend to have grief bursts, 
And then, then they turn. Next thing you know, they're playing and they're doing normal process, no, normal games, normal things. Um, and they, I guess, as I want to reiterate, children need to feel it's okay to talk about death and grief. However, if they don't want to talk about it, you need to respect that. You need to respect that. You can let them know that you're available, and you're available to listen and help. And that any feelings they have, like anger, sadness, fear, regret, are normal. Tell them it's okay. You know, this is how people feel. Hugging and touching often and usually helps the grieving child feel secure in expressing emotions. It means you're safe. And it also reassures them that they're loved and they're going to be cared about. Um, one of the um, leaders in the grief field, Alan Wolfelt, feels that if grieving children are ignored, they may suffer more from the sense of isolation than from the loss um, itself. And those adults who've experienced the death of someone close to them or a traumatic event, and keep in mind, it's probably the first time I've mentioned trauma. That's a whole other web, uh, webinar. Uh, I just derailed. Um, at any rate, you want to we're treated, we all know that they don't want to bring it up. It's like it's, it's like we're spoiling the party, okay? And so it's being, learning to be comfortable with their pain. And we don't, we want to, you know, we, we want to stay away from messages that, like, don't cry, you need to be strong, and now you're the man in the house. Um, be a good girl, your mommy needs your help now more than ever. And and don't you know? Try not to suppress the grief expression in children and set up unfair expectations of them. Generally, we have to intervene if you observe a child taking on the role and tasks of someone much much older than they are. Uh, children should not be allowed to take on the role of the confidant of the adult. Okay, let the child be a child. And you may be falling apart. When my daughter was killed, I was falling apart. I was not available to my daughter and my son, even though in my intro it does say that I had to navigate them through. Listen, navigating myself through the first year was hard enough. I had to be satisfied with putting shoes on that matched. Those kids were on their own. Fortunately, through the Compassionate Friends, actually, I realized how I was emotionally absent for them, and I have spent almost every day since then trying to make it up to them. So it is, while it's important uh, that we not hide our own feelings of grief from a bereaved child, and so that they know it's okay. Um, again, just to reiterate, be available to them. Avoid expressions that, uh, expressions that suppress grief. Uh, if you're grieving, don't hide your feelings from the child. And don't be surprised if your child gets mad at you if you're grieving. Um, allow your child to express religious and spiritual concerns. You know, if Jesus loves me, then, you know, is he going to take me too? And maybe I don't like him because he took my, my friends or he took my sister or he took my dog. It may be a pet. Um, children grow very, very attached to, uh, to, to their pets. That's another webinar. And allow them to remain in familiar surroundings. Try to avoid sending them away. Um, they need that familiarity. There will be plenty of people, ideally plenty of people around. Perhaps after a couple of weeks, you can let them go visit a best friend they haven't seen in a while who lives across the country. Or if you have a child that's extremely hyperactive um, by nature and they're grieving, and right there, if you've got an ADD kid, um, let me point this out right now because I think I missed it somewhere along the way, is that often grieving children behavior mimics ADD or ADHD. Okay, you start thinking, oh my God, you know, they're, they're bouncing off the wall. That can be a very normal grief reaction, so we want to be careful not to label a behavior as attention deficit or tell the doctor, I think they have ADD, and then put them on some kind of medication. You've got to be, 
ideally, if you don't know what to do, get on the internet, start searching for this question. Believe me, all this information's out there. Um, and it's just important that we recognize that children do grieve. So to end this, the grief is there, but it changes over time. I'd like to tell you it gets better and I'd be a big liar. It changes over time. Children re-grieve. They re-grieve when they graduate from high school and they see who's not there. They re-grieve if they're getting confirmed. They may re-grieve when they're having a First Communion if they're Catholic. They may re-grieve when they have a bar or bat mitzvah. Getting married, having a first baby, coming aware, becoming aware that I'll never have a niece or nephew, or I'll never, my best friend and I planned on, uh, look at the movie um, about the brides that were fighting. They were best friends since they were little kids. Uh, what if one of them had died? How would the other one have taken it? How can I get married when it's not supposed to be like this? Um, and I quoted from I Shall Wear Midnight, and I, I thought it was a good way to end this because she says, you know, can you take away this grief? And, and I'm sorry, I can say. I can tell you that I'm sorry. Everybody asks me that. It's true. I have been asked. Can you take my grief? Can you take it away from me? And I wouldn't do it even if I knew how to do it because it's yours. And the only time and tears can take that away. Because that's what they're for. Time and tears. Just time alone isn't going to get it. But time and tears. Tears is our body's way of releasing stress, tension, and pain. So we want to be aware of not taking a grief away by trying to make them feel better. Because in the end, you're really trying to you have to think, well, who am I trying to make them feel feel better? Who am I trying to make feel better? Am I trying to make myself feel better so I can walk away and say, well, they feel a little happier? Or do you, are you really trying to make them be okay? And sometimes feeling doing that just means being quiet, sitting with them, holding them, and just being emotionally available. So I think I've ended five minutes early. <laughs> Good job. Good job. I have some questions for you, if okay. you would be willing to take them. Um, uh, this one is, my daughter is 12 and lost her older sister three years ago. She says she is fine and deals with her grief by herself, usually at night in her bed. Is this healthy? She says she doesn't like to cry in front of me because she doesn't want to upset me. Uh, I try hard not to be emotional when she is. I think it I I think I accomplished this, but now I wonder. Right. She's telling you that she's grieving and she's more calm. she's gonna grieve the way she wants to grieve. In bed it's quiet. Um, you can pull the covers over your head, you can hold something um, this child sounds like she's, she's a private griever. Not all of us are grievers. We're public grievers. We look like nothing's wrong. Poker face. Another good place to cry and scream is the car or the shower. But no, it sounds to me like she, that's just how she grieves. And as for mom, um, you know, it, it, it's all right for her to see you get upset. That she knows you're grieving. And we do the best. If you're a bereaved parent, God bless you. You're doing the best you can. But in the end, it changes over time. And we do come out on the other side. But we're just different. So I hope that helps. Good, good. Um, Hazel, you said um, keep things age appropriate. How does a child grieve at different ages? Well, you know, a toddler, for example, or in, even an infant grieves, okay? An infant's going to get, uh, you know, if something happened to the, the, the parent parental figure, um, they may get cranky, grouchy, fussy, and you just can't comfort them. So even an infant is going to know something's not right, something's missing. Um, toddlers also, you know, are going to, you know, grieve because, you know, and think when is, you know, they, they think somebody's coming back. You know, when are they coming back? Um, 
age appropriate, let me get the question right. You're wanting to know what your question is, what are the age appropriate? Is that what you're saying? Right. How do they, how do, does a child grieve at different ages? You said, um, um, the, the sister or brother went away and, um, young children think of that as a trip away out, well, out of town or? Right. When you, when you back? say, um, well, Jesus came and, and, and got your sister and he took him to be in a flower in his garden. Kids are so little, you know, and, and they, you know, think of what's the image in their mind. So you might want to say, uh, depending on how, again, I said at the very beginning, who died, how they died, when they died, what, what were the circumstances. So let's say uh, it's, it's a cancer death. Uh, it's age appropriate what the kid asks. The child, well, well, why did she get cancer? Well, we really don't know. Sometimes cancer comes and um, get a brain tumor and, and you take them to the doctor and sometimes you just can't make them well no matter what you do. And when they die, we miss them very much. Um, I, I don't know how appropriate this is or not, but Pat, you asked me to do this. Whenever I have to talk and answer questions, you know, and I'm talking like, as I am now to I assume adults. Um, it's kind of like, what, if you, do you remember when you had to talk to your kid about sex? Just answer the question. Mm -hmm. You know, just answer the question. You don't have to go into the detail. Just answer the question. Mm -hmm. So let, let that child guide you. Um, children, again, depends on where they are and who it was. There's so many things that... Um, you know, at, at the different age groups, they know um, about death. They, they're, they're very much aware of it. They see dogs on the side of the road. Um, so they've seen it. You see a cockroach running across the um, kitchen floor. I'm getting a shotgun after that thing. That thing's going to be dead. So they know that. And now how many times have they said, kill it, kill it, it's a bug. So they know about death, but, and they, um, after, when they're about seven or eight years old, they start knowing that dead means dead. They're not coming back. So you might have to explain to them uh, that they don't have to breathe anymore. They don't need air. They don't get cold. They don't get hot. They don't get hungry. Um, children a little older than that, um, say uh, 10, 11, 12, they'll get into the zombie thing and ghosts and um, I had a ton of poems, uh, but I, I didn't, that, that are children's poem. One of them is Little Orphan Annie. And um, what is that thing about uh, go, gory go, gopher guts or something? <laughs> you know, but Greasy, grimy gopher guts. Grimy gopher guts. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, so they're talking, they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll joke about it. They can get very jocular about it. Um, and it depends, again, it, as far as when um, a, a baby dies, what do you tell a toddler about that? What do you tell a toddler about his favorite grandpa is dead? And what do you, you know, and, and what about special needs of those, those children? Um, just, you know, giving lots of love, being held, sheltered, um, trying to stick to a schedule, caring for them. And again, the, the, the older the child, and I'm not going beyond the age of 13 or 14 because adolescence and death is, is, um, is a week-long, that combination is a week-long seminar. But at any rate, um, um, when they get in, you know, Halloween, how many of them look at the, the Walking Dead? That's a real popular cable TV show. More than likely, the chill age group of kids I am talking about um, aren't allowed to watch it. However, you don't know what they're watching when they spend the night out. And in the very first, um, uh, in the very first show, the first one, uh, this deputy shoots a little girl in the face. Well, she's a zombie, and he's got to do it. But nevertheless, it's a kid. Mm -hmm. You don't know if they saw that, 
over at somebody else's house. I know from my own experiences, um, uh, I didn't know that the, the TV show Cops was on until my daughter called me and told me that um, how did her five years, uh, her, her eight-year-old know what a wife beater shirt was? And he said he heard it on Cops at Mimi's. He threw me under the bus. So you really don't, you don't know. Um, and what you can do is just be aware that even a baby grieves and they go through a process and they re-grieve, they might not understand it. You might have to explain it over and over and over until the child understands it. Does this make I hope this is yes. a question. It's a big question. Yeah, it is a big question. Sorry. Um, here's a question from Sarah. My son and daughter lost their 18-year-old sister to a drug overdose. My 11-year-old son doesn't want to cry or talk about her, doesn't think of her. We go to therapy. He thinks he shouldn't go. What do you, um, what, what to do when they don't want to talk, write, or acknowledge her? Will it subside? I'll leave him alone. You will acknowledge it. Grief and death is like a very un, un uh, desirable fungus, so to speak. It's not going to go away even after you treat it. Um, I think you are. The mom's doing the right thing. She's trying to get him to support, but he's not ready for it. He's not ready. You just keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on him, and you don't it's, you don't force him to go. Uh, they boy, every child is different. So they go through a period where one of them, especially if you have two or three kids and one, that's all they want to do is talk about it. But the other one says, "Shut up! I don't want to hear it." Um, so it 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 can flip flop back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I I guess if it were me, and this is just personal now, I would make him go. You don't have to go. So we're gonna go. But you don't have to. It's helpful if your city has a grief support group for children. In Mobile, Alabama, we have the Bay Area Grief Coalition. And it's been around now for about 12 or 13 years. And uh, they meet like twice a month on a Saturday. And these are volunteer counselors who meet with the kids and have a grief support. So you might enjoy that when he's with his peers. Kids do better with their peers. I do a lot, as you know, Compassion Friends conferences with the children. And man, they will start talking. I mean, the parents, you wouldn't believe it, what, what they'll do. We do a lot of therapy and art. Uh, art and therapy, I beg your pardon. They will express it. They'll find a way. But it might not just be with you. Mm -hmm. So you might not be the one they want to talk to because they're just for whatever reason. But it might be the coach. It might be the next door neighbor. It might be the dog. Okay. Um, oh, this is a tough one. Um, my daughter is five and recently lost her six-year-old brother and father in a car accident. She was also in and the only survivor. At five, she can't express her grief. She keeps drawing pictures of broken pieces over and over again. How do I help her? I have her in play therapy and art therapy, but the question is, how can she help her? You have a traumatized child, keep her, uh, give her, she's telling you how she feels. She can't speak, but she can show you. Let her draw, let her draw, and, and let her interpret them for you if she wants to. But let, evidently that's helping her. She's drawing out, uh, again, that comes into an extremely complicated grief response. Um, which is why I went and got my certification in this. Um, that she is, she's doing what she can, the best she can do right now. Just keep an eye on her and, and make sure she has plenty of crayons. Uh, evidently, if art is the media, you just happen to have some finger paints around. Happen to have some paint so she can she can do that, and she'll do it until she's ready to process this. Uh, I think you said she's going going to a play group, a therapy group. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just part of grieving. It is miserable when you're the mama and you've got a little one. And, and it's such a horrific tragedy that this little bitty five-year-old, her heart's too tiny to absorb 
this trauma and, and to take this away. But by allowing her and reassuring her, allowing her to be who she is, uh, would you like us to frame these pictures? And if it were me, and you know, I'd save them. I wouldn't show them off to everybody in front of her, but I'd save them because it's telling a story. She lacks the vocabulary. She can't say what she saw. And uh, the only example I can give you, and I'll make it quick, was at a conference of compassionate friends. The little girl's brother was shot in the car. Um, and the parents didn't realize it until she told them. They took him to a hospital. And in art therapy, she, um, I, I had asked them, here's clay, here's all kinds of media. Make me something that tells me what you remember the most about your brother or your sister. This little girl drew the, I mean, using clay to made this incredibly bloody um, heart. And with all these needles sticking in her toothpicks, and basically it represented he got shot in the chest. Was she upset at that, in that moment with me? No. She wanted me to know about it. She wanted to tell me. Well, see, I was sitting right next to him, and the next thing I know I heard, and so she used that as an opportunity to show me what she saw. You see? Mm -hmm. I didn't tell her what to do. You know, I just, it, it, she could have painted a picture. So, you know, they will, they'll find their way to communicate. I like to make a lot of, um, keep a lot of scrap paper and things around for the, for the younger ones, the, the ones that don't have the vocabulary. Okay. Good. Um, I'm sorry we're coming to a close here, so I'm going to just take one more question, and, and I'm sorry we are not able to get to the other questions, but you talked about kids re-grieving. Will you talk a little bit more about that? Is that when something big happens in their life, or? No. It may happen six months later when it, when it happens to be Christmas, and you're going shopping, and you know you don't have to buy a Prince One Plus present you're not going to buy. Ah. Mm -hmm. It may happen, I'm, I'm finally going to high school, and they're not there to see me do this. They're not there to help me with their homework, with my homework. They don't know, I don't have anybody to tell me about boys. Things come up. Um, you know, a young man doesn't know how to approach girls, and if it's big brother um, that is no longer available to him, then, and again, that can also be not just death, but being deployed. Lots of these kids have big brothers and sisters that are in, in, in harm's way. Um, you know, they are, um, I'm so sorry, I felt I derailed. <laughs> I oh, no, you did great. great. So, um, if you wanted to say one thing to remind me of what it was, I'll finish it. And be or re-grieving. Ah, okay. Uh, there's special events in our life. You know, I always, you know, you may always, I may have always wanted my brother or my father to be my best man, but he got killed or he died. Mm -hmm. uh, my, the first grandchild, he's not here to see it. I'm a great grandpa, but they're not there to see it. You know, it's, it's events that happen throughout our lifespan that we mark a birthday. Like, holy cow, I'm 21. I can drink a beer now, legally. This part, my sister will never turn 21, et cetera, that sort of thing. You re-grieve. Sure, understood. Okay. Hazel, this has been excellent. Great thank information. You. Great thank information. You thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. This webinar has been recorded, and it will be archived after it is processed on the Compassionate Friend website. Our webinars are recorded and posted at www.compassionatefriends.org. Our next webinar will be held on March 21st, when the topic will be death of a child from substance-related causes. You can register for that webinar on the Compassionate Friends website. When you visit the website, you can also find a local chapter of Compassionate Friends and also links to our Facebook and Twitter pages. Good night, everyone. And th Hazel, thanks again. And be well. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>